So I want to start uh, by reminding everybody that the whole reason uh, I decided to start Yu-Gi-Oh! Bros was to uh, host tournaments and harvest tournament data. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, event coverage is all well and fine, feature matches, you know, they're real interesting and stuff, but when you're preparing for an event, uh, I think having having answers to certain questions uh, really can help uh, prepare you for an event. And, uh, you know, those kind of questions are some of the things that uh, I'm hoping to address with uh, Yugi Overdose. And uh, what I've hoped to address here in this Excel file before me, uh, what you're looking at is a collection of hand assembled data uh, from uh, our first Dueling Network tournament. And I'm going to go over it right now because I understand that uh, numbers uh, can be intimidating to some people. Uh, they aren't to me, and I hope to make uh, help make sense of this to you. Um, once you once we get through this, I hope that you look at it and you know you realize that uh, I mean there are some limitations. The sample size is really small. The lim num limited number of decks, limited number of matchups, and stuff like that. But this is the sort of thing that we can get as a community if we all. Uh, you know, participate in these uh, online tournaments I'm hosting. Uh, anyway, let's just get right into it. Uh, I started um, my data analysis with, uh, by looking at four things. Metagame composition, win rates, deck construction, uh, and uh, uh, or in hindsight, and then deck construction when I look at staples. Uh, I'm going to go over these one by one. Uh, to start, um, I looked at metagame composition. Normally when you see... Um, maybe on the European coverage pages, you'll see like a breakdown of the event. You're going to see like a pie chart like this. And it's going to start off with, uh, I mean, that's how the tournament starts off. So in, our, in the tournament that we had, the first tournament, you know, we had a Dark World deck, a Hero deck, a Machine deck, etc., etc. And they made up, uh, proportionally speaking, 3% of the field and whatnot. Windups, like I've been saying this whole time, uh, took up the biggest uh, share of that pie. Uh, but the thing is, if you're playing in a tournament, and uh, at least in our tournament, the way that it worked when I cut to top four, I, I made that decision in advance because uh, I only wanted XOs and X1s to remain in contention. If it, if there was a bigger field, I would have tried to make it uh, so that some X2s would have uh, uh, stayed in content, stayed in contention. But as it was, uh, only you only could top if you went XO or X1 or finished XO and X1. So as you're playing in the tournament. You know, round one, you might have to deal with this Dark World deck or this Hero deck, but this, uh, and then, you know, round two, if they, if they lose, and then round, uh, round one and round two, if they lose, then you're not going to play them the rest of the tournament, at least if you're, you know, in, in sights of top, if it's relevant. So, uh, the metagame that is relevant to you as someone who's trying to top changes every round. Uh, so your matchups, you know, you can have a great matchup against Dark World, but that can have no effect on the tournament after round two. So, uh, you know, that's something to keep in mind. That's what I've done here. Uh, I looked at at the decks that were uh, uh, that were XO and X1 at the, I think, start of the round or end of the round? End of the round. That's what I did because I, I, I started from round zero. Uh, so round zero is when you start the event, and you'll see that's exactly what the tournament started with. Uh, round one, no one dropped. Uh, round after round two, though, uh, five folks dropped, and you can see how that changes the composition of the or the relevant uh, uh, part of the uh, tournament. Uh, windups saw an uptick, so windups didn't drop so much early. Um, but you did see, you know, two agent decks drop and waters and windups and a, it was a worm deck drop. As the tournament passed uh, to after round three, uh, some more people dropped and windups. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't read too much into this. this is just small numbers and whatnot uh, at play. But uh, you can see how the number of decks in contention drops. So, for example, if we look at, um, you know, right here, at the end of round two, heroes were still in contention. After at the end of round three, though. Uh, you know, not so much. So for everyone who's like, oh, you know, I'm going to uh, side deck these snowman eaters uh, and, uh, oh my god, the spell, uh, it's not the smashing, I can't believe it, the one you gain life, a thousand life, 
Soul Taker. There you go. So you can say, oh, I'm going to side deck Soul Takers and uh, my uh, my Snowman Eaters and whatnot. It's going to be useful for matchups like like the random hero deck. But in this tournament, after round after round uh, after round three, like it's just not relevant anymore. Uh, so that's you know something that you should keep in mind. And then you'll see as you scroll through this that the field changed. And then at the end here, I just uh, I looked at compared to the start of the tournament, compared to the end, and the percentage of the makeup, uh, you know, which decks, uh, if, if all things being equal, equal skill level, all decks, um, uh, not decks, all skill levels being equal, and assuming random distribution of matches, which isn't the case, um, you just have a sense of, you know, which decks did better than what they were represented or worse and whatnot, and uh, we see that uh, anti-meta, overperformed by the largest margin there was one person who played it and he made it to top agents there were three people who played it but only one made it to top waters there were i think three or four people who played four people who played water but uh uh only one topped and wine of 13 people uh played it but only one topped uh so proportionally speaking there was 13 percent of the field i mean 13 out of 32 went down to one out of four so i mean they underperformed but that's not I wouldn't read too much into that. It's just sort of interesting to know. Anyway, so you have a metagame composition, and that's all well and good. Now you know, oh, okay, you know, this is what I have to play against. But that's not really relevant unless you know how your deck fares against uh, each of these decks. So I've compiled win rates. I, I looked at all the reported results, and uh, uh, I see that, uh, for example, at table one, round one, Worms beat windups. He lost game one, he won game two, won game three. Uh, that table two, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I've taken all this and I've, I've done a couple things with this. The first thing I did, I'm just going to scroll over to the right. I looked at how many game threes there were each round. And over the course of the tournament, I wanted to see how many, uh, whoops. That's definitely. Anyway, so I looked at, uh, over the course of a tournament, uh, how many, uh, how many of these went to game three? And I saw that uh, 46 out of the 72 went to game three. Uh, I thought that was pretty interesting. Uh, but uh, it also accounts for uh, mirror matches, which I thought weren't really that relevant uh, to game three because they're just coin flips, um, or at least you expect them to be coin flips. Um, so what I did is I, uh, I first looked at how many, what was the likelihood of going to game three. And uh, I said, uh, the, well, the opposite of that. Like, if you're not going to game three, then you won 2 0. So your odds of winning game one and game two are 100 minus that. That's 36%. Uh, the odds of you uh, winning game one, losing game two, and then winning game uh, three is, uh, you know, 46%. And the odds of you losing game one and still winning the match are 18%. So if you're playing Yu Gi Oh! for the first time and you have no idea what any of your matches should be like, uh, on average, um, you should be going to game three uh, way more than half the time. Uh, or not, sorry. Yeah, way more than half the time. You should be going 64%. Uh, you, If you're playing, uh, or how how often should you expect to 2-0 someone? About a third of the time. So it's about two-thirds to a third. So that's really, if but nothing else, it, it, uh, it highlights how important side decking is. Because a lot of people, you know, they don't really care so much uh about their side deck they always focus on their main deck etc etc but if you look at this almost two-thirds of the games you're playing are going to be with your side deck so i mean that's a critical element of the game that's often underrated um i also looked at uh, the same thing with mirror matches this i uh i guess it's not that relevant but uh i mean i i just wanted to compare uh, how often these things, how often you went to game three in a mirror match compared to that. And shockingly enough, you went to game three less often, or the, at least the players in this tournament, uh, they were mostly wind up mirror matches. Um, and uh, they went to game three only 51% of the time as compared to 64% of the time. Uh, so that was pretty, pretty interesting. I'm not sure if that would hold over the bigger sample size, but whatever. This is just. You know, whatever. Re don't read too much into it. Anyway, uh, I also compiled the the win rates. So, so I looked at, uh, you know, I looked at all these and I said, okay, well, uh, uh, well, 
these here, agents, agents, anti-meta, anti-meta, these are all necessarily going to be half the time. That's what you can expect in the mirror match, da da da. But agents against cast dragons, and this is meant to be read uh, from left to top. So I say agents beat uh, cast dragons one out of the one time they played. Agents beat heroes zero out of the one time they played. Agents beat waters one out of the two times they played, etc., etc., etc. That was on overall. But because I had everyone report their matches like this, and oh, I won game one, game two, game three, I was able to, to separate this uh, by game one, game two, and game three, and see how they did in each particular game. Uh, and But the point of that, the cool thing about that, is you can see how side decking affects matchups uh, by using a very simple formula. Um, and these are these are just relative values. They're not absolute values. They're not indicative of anything. But uh, you compare, for example, how uh, I'll just take a random example. Um, so let's say I look at agents against cast dragons. Actually, that's a bad example. Let me use a like a more. Actually, I'll use windups against water. So what I did is I said, okay, uh, windups played against water. Uh, windups played against water. They played 10 games in total. Um, if you looked at overall, you see that it was actually split down the middle. So they're 50-50 they're against each other. But game one, windups beat waters 7 out of 10 times. Game two, though, windups beat waters 3 out of 2 times. And game three, windups beat waters 3 out of 6 times. So they went to 6 game threes. Uh, but uh, you can see that you know they wind up won more than half game one, and then uh, won less than half game two, and only won half game three. So side decking really hurts windups in this particular matchup. Uh, or or in other words, waters do better against windups game two and three. And you can see that by taking the average of this value three out of six, which is half plus three out of ten. So that's, uh, uh, they add up to be 8 out of 10, you divide it's 4 out of 10, so 4 tenths of the time, uh, windups will beat waters, game 2 and 3. Compare that to game 1, I just subtract, 4 out of 10 minus 7 out of 10 is negative 0.3, at, uh, negative 0.3 or negative 3 out of 10. So on my scale from negative 1 to 1, uh, windups, uh, fare worse game two you see this positive number indicates better pat most po better matchup post side negative number indicates worse matchup post side so it's a scale from negative one to one and uh yeah windups do worse game two and three that's just something to to keep in mind uh, you might have that advantage game one um but uh you know considering that almost two-thirds of your matches or in this case you know six out of ten uh, go to game three. That's something to keep in mind. Anyway, so this is just interesting. I, I'm, I'm a big advocate of, you know, preparing for your side deck. And, uh, you know, this is the sort of thing that um, is really telling for that. Now you'll see a lot of zeros. That means that, uh, you know, that's usually because people got too old or just because it balanced out. Uh, there were only, uh, I forget how many games there were. Uh, I did not write it down, but there there were a limited number of games. There were less than a hundred games over the course of this tournament. So, uh, you know, as you have more games, you can better approximate these things. But that doesn't mean that I can, over the course of ten tournaments, just add these all together because decks change over the course of time. Uh, this is only ever relevant for this one event. So you shouldn't think that windups will always fare worse games two and three against uh, waters. Um, because again, this is just for this one particular moment in time, and things are constantly changing. But uh, you know, if you sense that, you know, the wind, the typical windup decks and typical water decks haven't changed over time, maybe you can do that. But generally speaking, that's probably like a bad way to, to handle that. Anyway, uh, but the point here is that you you find out their overall uh, win rates, and then I go to deck construction, and I say 
Uh, in order to make, like, I'm just reading off the top. In order to make top four of this tournament, you practically had to maintain a record of XO or X1 all week. And so the original metagame composition from the start of the event becomes irrelevant. I said all this anyway. But the point is, so as the tournament progresses, you uh, the proportional representation of each deck of the relevant metagame changes. And so we, since each deck has a measurable win rate against every other deck, we can calculate which deck had the best odds of winning in a given round. And then you if you can calculate that you can just add them up and see which deck had the best odds of going undefeated uh so what i did is uh you know this was just a copy and paste from here except in the decimal form and then i went uh i went here and i just i took this pie chart and i put it together in decimal form uh you don't actually play out round six like these were after round zero which is before the tournament started and after or, or this would be technically at the beginning of round one beginning of round two beginning of round three whatever anyway so uh these don't really you don't really play with these but uh, but i can say okay look uh going back to my metagame composition round uh, one where's agents agents was 10 percent so it's really 9.3 the graph makes it oversimplified but uh so you have 9.375 uh and that's how much uh, agents made up the field. So if you look at uh, what beats agents, which uh, would be this line right here, you can see that uh, you know windups will be agents 60% of the time, waters are 50-50, heroes will be at 100% of the time. Again, it's not really true. Nothing will ever beat anything 100% of the time. But just this is specifically based only based on the data that we had. Uh, from this tournament so again don't read too much into it it's just to give you a sense of these sort of things uh, i think heroes only played against agents once so boom they win 100 percent of the time uh but the point is you can take uh you know 0. 0.6 multiply it by this add 0. 0.5 times this add one times this add 0. 0.5 times this and you come up with a number that number is this number which is uh it tells you uh how do i phrase this it tells you uh the odds how do i phrase this you um it's sort of like if you have two events two separate independent events and each of these have a 90% chance of, of them happening, then the odds of both of these things happening is 0.9 times 0.9 or 0.81. So even though both things are 90% chance of happening, the chances of both of them happening is only 81%. It's sort of like that. If you have like a 50% odds and you only have a 0.09% chance of, of playing against agents, you just multiply them together. And then you have a bunch of these, uh, a bunch of these together, so... You add them all up, and those are your collective odds of against playing against that. So it's hard to explain, but I guess as you as you do it or play with it or look at it, you'll you'll understand it better. But the point is, you can do this for every one of these, and this was this took forever. Uh, but uh, I, I get the collective win rates, and it's again it changes every round because the composition of each uh, of the meta. I mean of the of the relevant metagame changes every round. You can see, like for example, agents progressively. Well, they they become the they they start out as here. They get smaller, then they start picking up as more people drop out. And one guy I think stayed in contention, and then he stayed in contention. And he stayed in contention, and at the end of round six, he stayed in, like it made up a a bigger share of the metagame. Actually, you can see this right here. You see how agents went ten percent, sixteen percent. 825 it's not like more agent players are starting in the middle of the tournament it's just one guy staying as other people drop anyway so the point here is that again as the tournament progresses your matchup against agents becomes more relevant or at least in this particular tournament it became more relevant uh so if you had if you were one of these decks that had like for example heroes uh you had a 100 percent win rate against agents you become uh, becomes like a better choice to use or at least it did until round two but then hey that's awkward i think i just start stopped adding them that was a mistake i should go back maybe and fix that wow 
Well, I don't know why that's zero. Heroes be agents. Anyway, uh, I'll fix that. Ignore that one. But uh, anyway, the point is, though, that as you... Oh, sorry. Psh, this is the metagame composition. Down here. My bad. That's why. I don't have to fix anything. Uh, heroes should be a progressively better choice. Well, not right here, but that's because you see agents. They drop, but then they pick up again. And then that's where you see heroes pick up as a better deck choice. But in the end, it still winds up being a bad deck choice. But just to highlight the point that your matchups uh, matter, but only insofar as uh, the composition of, uh, as 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 the as the composition of the metagame is relevant to that. Anyway, so anyway, so the point is you come up with uh, these win rates. Uh, da -da 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 after each round again you're not really playing round six because this is at the end of round six uh, or this would be like at the beginning of round six which is when you would decide to play your match and then so you add all these up and you come up with these values and these values indicate uh, you know your highest like like this would be your likelihood of winning a round zero your likelihood of winning round one likelihood of winning round two round three etc and then you come up with these numbers and you, we see here that in this particular case, anti-meta proved to be the best tr deck choice uh, for the tournament because it had the highest chance of going undefeated in Swiss. That's largely attributable to uh, its great matchup against windups, measure measured by the way, uh, by the uh, uh, Majid Khan going four and zero against windups. So um, he was able to maintain a a good record against windups, and because windups were so uh, prevalent in this event, you know he gets. He gets 100% of that every round. If he plays against it, he's almost guaranteed to win. So, da 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 da. Again, if this was a bigger tournament, it had bigger people. I mean, num bigger numbers in here. You you wouldn't see that this point. I mean, this 1.0 as much and stuff like that. But for this small tournament, it just happened to be the case. And I'm not trying to interject this with any of my speculation. I'm just going off the numbers I got. So yeah, well, heroes proved to be the worst deck by having the lowest chance of uh, doing well. Uh, again, you know, this is um, something to point out. It's also, this is, how do I phrase this? Heroes, they show, like, you see the low number, but it's important to understand that a lot of that is because right here, you know, you, you don't see heroes having a good matchup against anything. And that's because there are holes here. You know, we, we didn't put heroes against anti-meta. We didn't put it against burn. We didn't put it against chaos dragons. Uh, but those matchups have real values. So uh, it's it's not like when you play heroes against anti-meta, the world explodes and you don't get to finish that match. You finish that match and you can measure which deck does better. Uh, but in this tournament, they didn't play against each other. So there's no values to work off of. So was heroes really the worst deck choice? I doubt it. Uh, I very much doubt it. You'll see like, for example, waters and windups, you know, they, they have a, pretty defined matchups over relatively speaking at least compared to heroes so i wish there was a way i could weight this better uh i don't think it makes sense to you know just divide my waters number by nine or this by ten I, that to come up with something i don't think that makes sense maybe it does i don't really know um I don't know of any good way to weight it, I guess. So don't take these in into too too ser don't take them too seriously. I win it, I would think that uh, I don't know. I'm sure there's a better way to do this. But the point is if 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 I had a big enough tournament where all these decks played against all of uh, all of every other deck ten times and I had accurate values here, uh you know, this would these numbers would be way more truer to their actual values. But right now, it's just to give you like a rough, very rough approximation. Uh, but anyway, it's just cool to like if you did have that. If if for example at a YCS, if you like, you would this table would be a lot more filled out. If and that would be really awesome. Then you could have like real senses of what the real deck, real best deck for the tournament was. But my off the cuff. Uh, you know, 
halfway done sort of data revealing this. That's pretty interesting. I still thought about that was interesting. Separately, uh, I sorted through uh, all the image deck lists and I went, I typed them all up. I, I made it so that I accepted image deck list because it was easier for everybody else. It was not easier on me to do some, uh, some of this, this aspect of it. I do want to thank, um, Alan Pennington though. He did give me a, a script once I typed out everything to come up with the frequency of certain cards that didn't tell me how many players played each card, uh, which I thought I, which I wanted. So I had to go back and do it anyway, but I still want to thank him for giving me a script to help me out with that. Uh, but anyway, so what I did here is I, uh, I looked at the overall top 10 most popular non-theme main deck cards. So, for example, if you're playing wind-ups and whatnot, I'm not looking at your wind-up rats and wind-up rabbits and stuff. I looked at other cards, and they're mostly staples. You see that mo the, greatest num the greatest number of players played Dark Hole and Monster Reborn. Uh, so those were the most kind of stapled cards. By the way, that's, a, that's something important. I, I, uh, I didn't... I didn't rate rank these by the number of copies of each card. That's something you might see in uh, other tournament things. You'll see like, oh, look, the average number of this card, da, 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 da. I didn't do that. I ranked it by the number of players. I felt like that was a better way of ranking that. But I did include the average number in each deck. Obviously, these cards are limited. They're only going to have one. Uh, right under that, you'll see, you'll see that uh, the... There were 28 players played Heavy Storm and Mystical Space Typhoons, which are the second most popular cards. On average, players played 2.25 copies of Mystical Space Typhoons. So that just means it's not like, you know, people are playing two and then they rip up their Mystical Space Typhoon. It just means that more people played two than played three. Or, you know, two and one than played three or something like that. Uh, the next staple, Tour Guide, Sangin, Solemn, Torrential... And Solemn, Pot of Avarice, D-Prison, da, da da I thought it was interesting that more players played D-Prison than played Bottomless. However, on average, more people played more Bottomlesses than they played the D-Prison. I thought that was kind of cool. Uh, Spirit Reaper, Maxi, Pot of Duality. I, did, I stopped at 10 after a certain point. Uh, I think in the future, I would only ever look at whatever's above half the field so i probably stop right here 16 players and up i think that's probably best um side deck cards were different because uh you know not all 30 players are going to side deck the same thing everyone's playing a different deck they have different uh things you'll see though that uh most most players or the greatest number of players um oh yeah that's how i, I did break that down like that 31 percent of the field all right so anyway uh you know, a lot of people beside deck the Typhoon, Soul Taker, Dust Hunter, Dimensional Fissure, Effect Veiler, Snowman Eater, Thunder King, Nobleman, Goes and Soul Drain, Reaper, Cyber Dragon, Needle Ceiling. These are all like popular cards. I mean, you you know these just as well as I do. Uh, the cool thing I think over the course of time, as tournaments progress and whatnot, will be to look at how these number of cards or or how these cards ranked this way change and. Uh, I put trend analysis for the first because it's the first tournament. There's nothing available, but by the second tournament, if I see that uh, you know Thunder King rises or Thunder King lowers, you know that can affect uh, your deck decisions. Same thing with Noldman across of. You're playing um, uh, Gear Gear, right? Like you want to, you want that number to drop, and you know maybe not now is not the t right time if a quarter of the field are playing. An average of 1.88 Nolman of crossouts in their side deck. Like, maybe, I mean, I don't know. That's just for you to decide. But, uh, you know, it might be better if you wait till that number drops, et cetera, et cetera. But it gives you, like, a good sense of uh, where things are going. It's also really cool in conjunction later on. You can't do that right this right now. But if you look at these win rates, how does side decking affect matchups? And you can do a trend analysis for this, too. I didn't include it. But I should really right here. Um, if this, uh, how do I put this? Let's say, for example, we're going back in time a little bit uh, to when I think it was last format or maybe two formats. I think it was last format. Uh, before Messenger of Peace was around, uh, 
you know, Dino Rabbit was just stomping on insectors or whatever. And insector side started side decking Messenger of Peace. And you would see that here. You would see one week it's not here. Next week it would be right here. The next week it would be here. The next week it'd be right here. And you see as Messenger of Peace increases, you can also see that the win rate uh, for games two and three or the side decking, uh, you know, that, that will affect the matchup greater like uh, there's no insectors here but let's say it's right here boom dino rabbit insectors beat dino rabbit it started going from negative point whatever to positive something then it's like whoa you know i can actually trace the effectiveness of e of emerging tech emerging side deck tech or as the case was emer emerging uh main deck tech if you want to look at the overall and the game one rates you can look at the the trend of that and then compare that to popular non-theme main deck cards. Uh, I thought that was really interesting. So um, over time, that's something I hope to do by uh, by looking at that. Uh, next, I looked at the most popular main deck oops, main deck uh, cards by deck type. Uh, so I only looked at the ones that had uh, multiple pl people playing a deck. If you if there was only one person playing a deck like Machines or Dark Worlds, there's no trend among decks. So I ignored that altogether. And uh, so for all the Agents players, uh, the most popular thing that was in all three decks were Shine Ball, the, you know, exa exactly what you would think. Everyone played Thunder King, average copy were two, I think it was like two, two, and three, so the average is like 2.33. Um, uh, you know, these everyone played these cards. Uh, only two players played Call, Maxi, Trooper, Warning, Tarantial, da 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 so you can go through this yourself if you want to play waters and you have a sense you have a sense of what other people are playing and maybe you just want a net deck or something like that you know just something to keep in mind uh same thing with windups uh, uh and then i also looked at the popular side deck cards and this just gives you a sense like if you're playing the deck for the first time it's like oh what are other people side decking maybe you can start there um but as i point out in this note up here there are two kinds of players in this game the kind that look at how many mystical space typhoons that the average player used and the kind that look at, for example, the average number of wind-up factors in each wind-up deck and the metagame composition of wind-ups in the later rounds of the tournament. I encourage you to be the latter sort of player. So I'm giving you information here, but that doesn't mean copy. That means, oh, look, this is what you're going to have to deal with in the metagame. For example, if you're playing a deck that's susceptible to uh, Mystical Space Typhoon and... Uh, uh, and Dust Tornado, right? And you really don't want your opponent to have a Dust Tornado on side deck... Uh, you know, maybe now is not the time to play playing that deck. It might be a good time if you're playing a deck that you know is weak to World Decree because no one's fucking. I mean, no one's using World Decree. They're like five players play one trap stun. So you know, maybe Burn's the way to go right now. Who knows? I don't know. Anyway, that's for you. Just that's for you guys to decide. Uh, the point is that uh, you know here's just here's some information whether you're starting out or you want to try a deck for the first time or you want to build your deck to be a, these decks as they enter the tournament etc etc you can look all that up for yourself and then the last thing i did uh is i just said well if i know that uh let's say uh i think i only looked at the the number the highest number of common things so like uh, i'll use windups as an example all 13 players of windups played these cards and in these quantities everyone played three wind-up magicians everyone played three wind-up rats uh etc etc and uh so i looked at that and i said well on average then one sangan two tour guy that's three six nine da, 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 da. this adds up to a number every if everyone's gonna have that then windups have 24, this adds, adds up to 24.85 slots. Uh, of all the worm players, though, you see how they all their deck was, everyone played Starlight Road, everyone played Bottomless, everyone played Compose. This number adds up to 36. So if you're looking at which deck has the most room for variety, or that, you know, the, uh, the greatest number of differences as across the number of players that play it uh at least in this tournament 24.85 uh, of the slots and windups uh were basically pre-made for you uh but you had to come up with 
you know, the extra 15.15 slots. Whereas in Worms, uh, 36 of the slots were basically pre-made for you. So you had to only come up with four. So that makes Worms kind of the easiest to build and wind up the kind of, kind of like the hardest to build. Um, I wouldn't, I also wouldn't read too much into this. Windups also had 13 players as opposed to anything else. So obviously that number is going to be smaller than anything else. Uh, I thought it was interesting that agents, only three people played that, but that had a lot of diversity. So maybe agents are really hard to build too. Hard in the sense that there's a, um, a great deal of variety that you can go back and forth from. Anyway, uh, so that's, uh, that's what's in this file. Like I said, uh, it's going to be, uh, uh, in the in the description below just click it download it uh, do whatever you want with it write an article about it uh, post your own YouTube video about it uh, if you think it's uh, representative of the the real big metagame right now I understand uh, you know we're gonna have to deal with fire fists and that make that changes things up but uh, whatever it still could be useful anyway uh, so I hope I helped you make sense of all this. I understand it's in an Excel spreadsheet, and I understand it's numbers, and it's not greatly formatted and things like that. Uh, just bear with me. Like I said, I'm doing this by hand. Um, or in time, though, all this will be automated, and uh, it'll look real pretty and downloadable and stuff like that. And uh, just check back after the next tournament and maybe see this filled out, too. Uh, that's all. Enjoy, take care, bye-bye.